Welcome to the chilling realm of true crime as we embark on a journey through the darkest corners of human nature. In this video, we explore the harrowing stories of four infamous serial killers whose monstrous deeds continue to haunt us to this day. Unravel the twisted minds and heinous crimes of William Aarons, Dale Cregan, Moses Sithole, and Lee Boyd Malvo. William George Aarons, also known as the Lipstick Killer, was a serial killer from America. He was convicted in 1946 after he confessed to murdering three people between June 1945 and January 1946. He got the nickname for the notorious message scribbled in lipstick at the crime scene. Raised in an impoverished, dysfunctional family, Aarons began committing crimes when he was still a child. However, he hoarded all his loot, never selling any of them. After his arrest, the stolen items were recovered from an unused shed on the roof of a building near his house. In the next two years, he was sent to two different Roman Catholic youth detention centers. Despite his criminal activities, Aarons thrived in his academic life, excelling in all of his subjects. He was accepted in the University of Chicago's special learning program. But he relapsed to being a serial burglar which eventually led to the first murder in June 1945. After his arrest, he was tortured and injected with sodium pentothal or as it is colloquially called, the truth serum. He eventually confessed and was sentenced to life imprisonment. He later recanted his confessions, stating that they were given under duress caused by police brutality and coercive interrogation. Aarons died in prison at the age of 83. William Aarons was born on November 15, 1928, in Evanston, Illinois to George and Margaret Aarons. His paternal grandparents were Luxembourgish immigrants. Growing up in the 1930s Chicago, he was well familiar with poverty and crime. His home did not provide a refuge either. His parents argued endlessly and to avoid listening to it, he would often leave the house and roam around the neighborhood. It was during these wanderings that he began to steal. He would later state that his early crimes were mostly for fun and to relieve tension. At 13, he was arrested for the first time after police caught him with a loaded gun. The authorities searched the Aaron's house, finding a considerable amount of stolen weapons in an unused shed on the roof of a building in the neighborhood. As he never sold the stolen goods, the rest of the loot was discovered there as well. He pleaded guilty to 11 counts of burglary charges and spent the next few months at the Guybald School for Wayward Boys. Soon after, he was arrested a second time for theft slash larceny and was sent to St. Bede Academy, a youth correction facility operated by Benedictine monks, where he spent the next three years of his life. In the institution, he proved his academic merit by excelling in mathematics, biological science, and social science. Seeing his impressive test scores, his teachers encouraged him to apply for the University of Chicago's special learning program. He received his acceptance letter right before his release and at 16, he started his classes in the 1945 fall term. In the beginning, he used to live at his parents' house and commute to the university. But he realized it was not a sustainable option and relocated to the university's Gates Hall. Aarons worked as an usher or as a docent at the university to support himself. Bright, intelligent, and handsome, Aaron soon became popular among both the students and professors. However, he returned to the life of crime, committing a series of burglaries in homes near the university. The three murders that Aaron's confessed to, and was later convicted of, were of 43-year-old Josephine Ross, 33-year-old Francis Brown, and 6-year-old Suzanne Degnan. Ross' body was discovered on June 5, 1945, in her apartment at 4108, North Kenmore Avenue, Chicago. She had multiple stab wounds on her torso and her head was wrapped in a dress. The investigators suspected that she had accidentally confronted an intruder who, on being surprised by her presence, had ended up killing her. They found dark hair in the clutches of her hand and concluded that she had struggled with her assailant before her death. Ross then fiancé, former husbands, and boyfriends all had alibis. The police began searching for a dark-haired man who had been wandering in the area but could not locate him. Brown was found dead on December 10, 1945, in her apartment at 3941 North Pine Grove Avenue, Chicago. 
she had a knife lodged in her neck and a bullet wound on her head. There was a message written in lipstick on a wall of the apartment. It read, for heaven slash say touch me slash before I kill more slash I cannot control myself. On January 7, 1946, Dignan's family realized that six-year-old Suzanne was missing from her first floor's bedroom at 5943 North Kenmore Avenue, Edgewater, Chicago. The investigators found a ransom note with the following written on it, D $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills I in fives and tens. On the back of the note, there was an instruction, burn this for her safety. Degnan's father was a senior office of Price Administration OPA, executive and in the mid-1940s, the organization was considering the extension of rationing to dairy products, infuriating the meatpackers who were on a strike at the time. Several other executives had already received threats against their children. Edward Kelly, the then mayor of Chicago received a note that read, This is to tell you how sorry I am not to not get old Degnan instead of his girl. Roosevelt and the OPA made their own laws. Why shouldn't I and a lot more? The authorities initially thought that one of the meatpackers had kidnapped the girl. The authorities received an anonymous phone call that told them to look in the sewers near the Degnan home. Following the instruction, police found the disembodied head of the girl in a storm drain a block away from her home. The rest of her body parts were gradually discovered, with each part found in the sewer located further from her house than the last. The case caught the attention of both the media and the public. There were several suspects, including a 65-year-old janitor named Hector Verberg and a recently discharged Marine named Sidney Sherman. Both Verberg and Sherman were eventually cleared with the former successfully suing the Chicago Police Department for the torture he had been put through during his interrogation. There were also two significant confessions. Vincent Costello, a local teenager, confessed that he had killed the girl and made calls to the Degnan home at the day of the incident, demanding ransom. However, he later revealed that he had made the calls after overhearing police officers discussing the case. He had nothing to do with the murder. The second confession came from Richard Russell Thomas, a nurse who had been once suspected of molesting a child. He readily told the police that he had murdered the girl. But by then, there was a new suspect that the authorities were interested in. Aarons had been apprehended by the police while he was trying to flee a burglary scene. He had a gun and allegedly pointed it at one of his pursuers. Thomas later recanted his confession, but the media was already focused on Aarons. After his arrest on June 26, 1946, Aarons was interrogated rigorously. He later claimed that he was questioned for six days straight, was regularly beaten, and not given any food or drink. Dr. Haynes and Dr. Grinker, psychologists with the police, administered sodium pentothal to him without a warrant or an explicit consent from either Aaron's or his parents. In the next three hours, according to the authorities, Aaron's talked of an alternate personality who he called George. He reportedly said that it was George who had committed the murders. He never gave George's last name to the police. When asked, he stated that he could not remember and that it was a murmuring name. The authorities presumed it was Merman, the media sensationalized it as Murder Man. Later, in 1952, Dr. Grinker would state that Aarons had never implicated himself in any of the murders. He was administered lumbar puncture without anesthesia on the fifth day since his arrest. They had to reschedule his polygraph test after concluding that he was in too much pain. When he did undergo the test, the results were inconclusive. During this period, the press played an instrumental role in controlling public opinion on errands, even allegedly affecting the investigation itself. George Wright, a staff reporter with Chicago Tribune wrote an article on the murders on July 16, 1946. He conjured up details and cited questionable sources to blame errands for the three murders and reported that he had already confessed. Soon the rest of the news outlets in Chicago were convinced that Aarons was the murderer. His defense team was convinced that he was guilty. So when the prosecutor offered him a plea bargain, which would save him from execution if he confessed to the crimes, they began pressuring him to accept the deal. Thus 17-year-old Aarons and his parents signed a confession. 
While the initial deal was for one life term with a few minor charges, after Aarons appeared uncooperative at a news conference, it was extended to three life terms. One of the hard evidences gathered during the investigation was a smudged fingerprint that the authorities at first stated did not match Aarons, but that statement was eventually retracted and it was confirmed that it did belong to Aarons. A knife, which he admitted of using to cut up Degnan and throwing it on the subway track near the scene of the murder, was also discovered. Following his arrest, his parents and younger brother changed their last name to Hill. On August 7, 1946, Aarons confessed to the murders before the court. Prompted by the prosecutors, Aarons reenacted his crime in the Degnan home. On the night of September 4, he tried to commit suicide but was discovered by the guards. He later revealed that despair had led him to attempt suicide. He was sentenced to three life terms. When asked by Sheriff Michael Mulcahy if the girl had suffered, Aarons replied that he did not know, he had not murdered her. He further requested Mulcahy to tell the girl's father to take care of his other daughter as the killer was still out there. Immediately after his sentencing, William Aarons recanted his confession. He was housed at Stateville Prison in Joliet, Illinois till 1975 and then moved to the Minimum Security Vienna Correctional Center in Vienna, Illinois. In 1988, he requested to be transferred to the Dixon Correctional Center Minimum Security Prison in Dixon, Illinois. Throughout his life, he continued his unsuccessful efforts to gain clemency. He died on March 5, 2012 due complications caused by diabetes at the University of Illinois Medical Center. Dale Cregan is an infamous English drug dealer and murderer who was convicted of four murders, which he committed within a few months in 2012. Born and raised in Greater Manchester, Dale started selling and consuming marijuana while in high school. He also developed a very unhealthy fetish for knives and other murder weapons, and by the age of 22, he had started selling cocaine on the streets. Dale is also known as One Eye, due to his missing left eye. The true cause of the injury remains unknown to date, but Dale maintains that it was the result of a street brawl, but this has not been confirmed from any source. Soon, he got entangled with a few street criminals. In May 2012, he claimed his first victim, Mark Short, and shortly after this, he killed Mark's father. Later, he killed two police constables. Following a long trial, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in June 2013. He is presently stationed at the HM prison, Full Sutton. Dale Cregan was born on June 6, 1983, in Greater Manchester, to Paul and Anita Marie. He was their middle child. He grew up with an elder brother and a younger sister. Soon after Dale's sister was born, his father abandoned the family and started living with another woman. Dale grew up without a father and hated him for leaving them. This hatred further amplified and Dale turned into a very aggressive kid. Dale attended the Little Moss High School in Droylston. While he was in high school, Dave started selling drugs to make some extra money. Soon, he started dealing in marijuana. As a youngster, Dale was a very aggressive kid, which resulted in fistfights with other street hooligans every now and then. He did not attend college and got into drug trade instead, as it meant easy money. Dale developed a fetish for knives as soon as he entered adulthood. Now a notorious youngster, he also started developing an interest in large guns. He stayed with his sister in Tenerife for about 18 months, and during that time, he bought guns with the illegal money that he had made, thereby building a collection. As Dale Cregan went deeper into the drug trade, he started making quite a lot of money. By the time he was 22, he had started selling cocaine and made close to 20,000 pounds a week. He led a lavish life, which was full of holidays in exotic destinations. He booked suites in high-end hotels. He also made frequent visits to Amsterdam, a city highly infamous for its underground weapon market. In one of those trips, he got his left eye carved out and boasted about it in front of his friends. He said that it was due to a fistfight that occurred in Thailand. The true cause is yet to be determined. Leading a lavish life, he started a serious romantic relationship with Georgia Merriman. Dale became a father at the age of 24 and the family lived in a grand three-bedroom apartment in Droylston. 
Little did he know that he was entering the territory of David Short, the notorious gangster. David Short was a highly feared and infamous criminal. Dale's grand lifestyle caught his eye soon after Dale moved in the locality. The inevitable feud started brewing and it resulted in a ruthless end. Dale shot David's son, Mark, on May 25, 2010, at the Cotton Tree Pub in Droylston. During the shootout, he had also aimed to kill three other men but they managed to escape. Mark died on the spot. This gave rise to an ugly rivalry between the two outlaws. David Short privately warned Dale that he would rape Dale's four-year-old son and would kill him afterward as revenge. This further infused Dale with rage and he constructed a delicate plan to kill David. On August 10, 2012, Dale shot David nine times to kill him on the spot. After shooting him, Dale threw a hand grenade at David's body, and it was blown to pieces. The murder was gory and ruthless, as David's body was found in a highly deformed state. This incident led to Dale losing his mind, which further had him shooting down two police constables. He made a false emergency call on September 18, 2012, and lured the police into coming down to his place. There, he shot down Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes, firing 32 bullets in 31 seconds, and followed the gunshots with grenades. The officers died on the spot. This led the police to embark on a highly aggressive manhunt. However, Dale fled immediately. While on the run, he stayed in touch with some of his friends and boasted about the £50,000 reward on his head. Even when he was on the run, he enjoyed his life to the fullest. He drank beer, snorted cocaine, and lived in high-end hotels. However, he could not run for a very long time and eventually, in February 2013, turned himself in. His trial began on February 4, 2013, and during the initial phases, he was detained at the Manchester prison. His trial finally began, under heavy security, at the Preston Crown Court. Helicopters, cars, and bikes accompany the convoy that escorted him to the court from the prison. Police snipers were set up in the nearby buildings. This was one of the most high-profile and expensive trials that the country had seen in a very long time. It is estimated that over £5 million were spent in preventing any untoward incident during the trial. During his trial, Dale is said to have become conscious about his appearance and asked the prison staff to make him seem more presentable. He requested them to shave his beard and to cut his long hair. He took long baths and wore new clothes to the trials. Dale underwent two checks every day. These checks were mostly focused on his missing left eye. The police were suspicious and thought something was not right. The trial concluded eventually, and Dale was convicted of all four murders and three physical assaults. The gruesome nature of the murders that he committed had the court sending him to life imprisonment with a whole life order. It meant that Dale would be spending the rest of his life behind bars for sure. The final hearing took place on June 13, 2013. Just a few months after he was imprisoned, Dale embarked on a hunger strike at the HM prison full Sutton. This led to some serious health issues and police had to transfer him to Ashworth Hospital in September 2013. Following his arrest and life sentence, the underworld of Manchester saw some really gruesome shootouts for a while. Moses Sithole is one of South Africa's most notorious criminals, who is currently serving imprisonment for at least 38 murders and 40 rapes. He grew up in a disturbed environment. His mother had abandoned him at a local police station. Later, a woman had falsely accused him of rape, an allegation for which he was imprisoned. Both the reasons attributed to his hatred toward women, which transpired into his criminal instincts. He would lure women on the pretext of offering them jobs and then commit heinous crimes. Sithole somehow managed to escape after committing the crimes. Finally, an investing team was established. He was found guilty in 1997. Since capital punishment was unconstitutional in South Africa back then, Sithole was sentenced to imprisonment. It was made sure that he would remain behind bars for the rest of his life. Moses Sithole was born on November 17, 1964, in Vaslouris, near Boxburg, Transvaal Province, now Gauteng. 
he was one of the five children of Simon and Sophie Sid Hall. His father died when he was five, and his mother, unable to raise the children single-handedly, left them at a local police station. Sid Hall and his siblings grew up in an orphanage. He later revealed that he was mistreated at the orphanage. According to Sid Hall, he was a teenager when he was first arrested for rape and was sentenced to seven years of imprisonment. He later claimed that the imprisonment had turned him into a criminal. Sid Hall was quite sexually advanced even at a tender age. He had several relationships, but those were short-lived. Some theories suggest that his mother's act of deserting and neglecting him and his siblings had played a significant role in turning him into a misogynist. He reportedly shared his past relationship traumas with some of his rape victims. It is not known exactly when Sid Hall committed his first crime. However, his first recorded crime dates back to September 1987, when he allegedly raped a 29-year-old woman named Patricia Kumalo. She testified against him at his 1996 trial. Subsequently, three of his rape victims came out in public. One of them was Bias Wadora Swakamisa, who was reportedly attacked in February 1989. Her police complaint got him arrested and tried. In 1989, Sid Hall was sentenced to six years of imprisonment in the Boxburg prison for raping Swakamisa. Sid Hall claimed his innocence throughout the trial and was released in 1993 on the grounds of good behavior. Sid Hall realized that if the rape victims went free, it could put him in trouble. Soon, reports claimed that four young black women had been found dead, raped and strangled, according to investigations, in a Terrigeville, west of Pretoria, between January and April 1995. Soon, a series of rapes and murders were reported in that area. Unfortunately, the media did not pay much attention to the case. The police continued to discover dead bodies in the area. On July 17, 1995, a witness claimed he had seen Sid Hall with a young woman whose dead body was later found. However, the witness failed to identify the killer as Sid Hall. The Pretoria Murder and Robbery Unit established a special investigating team to determine whether it was an act committed by a serial murderer. On September 16, 1995, another body was found at the Van Dyke Mine near Boxburg. The worried local authorities sought help from retired FBI criminal profiler Robert Ressler. He began his investigation on September 23, 1995. All those who had known Sid Hall claimed he was mild-mannered. While the investigation of the crimes was on, he was managing a shell organization named Youth Against Human Abuse, which worked against child abuse. Sid Hall had committed murders in a Terry Jevil, near Pretoria, then in Boxburg, and eventually in Cleveland. His crime pattern was hence called the ABC murders. By 1995, he was accused of over 30 murders. In some cases, as later revealed, he would call the victims' families to taunt them. The ongoing panic among the public prompted President Nelson Mandela to visit Boxburg and appeal to people to assist the investigation. According to the reports of the investigation, the victims were subjected to the murderer's frustration for his own pleasure. Sid Hull primarily targeted black women between 18 and 45. He promised most of them jobs in his ersatz charity. He would then take them to remote fields, where he would rape them. He would then strangle the victims with their own underwear. Sid Hall later revealed that his victims reminded him of the women who had falsely accused him of rape in the past. In August 1995, Sid Hall was seen with one of the victims, but he escaped after SAP's investigators learned about his previous rape verdict. The investigators found that one of the victims, Amelia Rapidile, was last seen before she went to meet Sid Hall on September 7th that year. It was found that she was offered a job. The body of another victim, Agnes Mbuli, was discovered near Benoni on October 3, 1995. The same day, Sid Hall called South African journalist Tamsin De Beer, claiming to be the killer. He indicated that all of his 76 murders, almost double of what was reported, were his ways of avenging his unjust imprisonment. An attempt to trap him failed, and three more bodies were discovered over the following 10 days. Following this, his profile was made public. 
Sithul tried to reach his family members for help, but undercover police personnel intercepted him on October 18, 1995. While trying to escape, he attacked a constable and was shot in the leg and stomach. He was admitted to a local hospital and was later moved to the military hospital in Pretoria, where he admitted his crimes. On October 23, 1995, Sithole was accused of 29 murders in the magistrate's court in Brackpan. On November 3rd, he was moved to Boxburg Prison to wait for his trial. He had served two years of imprisonment there for a rape he had committed. Around the same time, he was reported to be HIV positive. Sithole's trial began on October 21, 1996. He was charged with 38 murders, 40 rapes, and 6 robberies. He pleaded not guilty to all of them. During the trials, Sithol maintained a cool and calm demeanor. On December 3, 1996, the prosecution released a video of Sithol admitting to committing 29 murders. He revealed that he had begun his murder spree in July 1995, selecting only those who resembled bias with Doris Swakamisa, who was responsible for his first jail sentence. However, the legality of the tape was questioned, as it was shot in a jail cell. Hence the trial was delayed until January 29, 1997. Sithole's original confession further dragged the trial until July 29, 1997, when the tape was finally considered as evidence. The prosecution restored its case on August 15. On December 4, Sithole was found guilty of all charges. Since the death sentence was unconstitutional in South Africa back then, on December 5th, Sithole was sentenced to 50 years of imprisonment for each of the 38 murders, 12 years of imprisonment for each of the 40 rapes, and 5 years of imprisonment for each of the 6 robberies. The consecutive sentences amounted to 2,410 years of imprisonment and a mandatory 930 years of service to receive eligibility for parole. Sithole was kept in the CMAX security section of the Pretoria Central Prison. He is currently imprisoned in the Mungoan Correctional Center in Bloemfontein. Sithole met his wife, Martha Ndlovu, while serving his first jail term. She left him two months before his second arrest. He has a daughter with Martha. Lee Boyd Malvo is a convicted murderer who committed murders in the Washington metropolitan area for three weeks in October 2002. He befriended John Allen Muhammad who later became father figure to him. It is along with Muhammad that Malvo committed the crimes and killed many innocent lives. In 2009, Muhammad was executed, while Malvo is serving multiple sentences at Red Onion State Prison, Virginia. The brutality of their crimes made them psychopaths in public eyes. Their actions were termed psychopathic having serial killer characteristics. Despite this, some researchers believe that their behavior and characteristics are highly debatable. In 2012, Malvo revealed that he was once sexually abused by Muhammad. As per Craig Cooley, one of Malvo's defense attorneys, Muhammad tricked Malvo into believing that the $10 million ransom which they were seeking from the U.S. government to put an end to sniper killings would be used to establish a society for homeless black children in Canada. Lee Boyd Malvo was born on February 18, 1985 in Kingston, Jamaica, to Una James and Leslie Samuel Malvo. He spent most of his childhood in Jamaica. Malvo was neglected as a child, as his parents were often absent. He was left in the care of others and was thus little supervised. In 1998, Malvo and his mother moved to Antigua. It was during this time that Malvo met Mohammed, and by 2001, he entered USA. When he was living with his mother in Miami, Malvo attended high school for a brief period of time, and later they moved to Bellingham, Washington. Malvo was living in a homeless shelter where he developed a strange bond with Mohammed. He had begun to consider Mohammed as a father figure and would play chess with him. Since Mohammed was a former member of US military, he also taught Malvo how to shoot and they would often practice shooting. In 2002, Malvo and Mohammed began to plan the attacks by touring around the country. They killed three people and injured one in Maryland and Louisiana in September. In October 2002, they started their assault on Washington, D.C. area using a rifle. 
they created their own sniper nest in the trunk of their car and worked together as a team. While one would select the victims, the other one pulled the trigger. They ended up killing 10 people and injuring three others. After the attacks, people in Maryland and Virginia were living in fear of the sniper shooters. The police too had difficulty finding clues to arrest them as they had no particular pattern and attacked anyone irrespective of age. After their ninth kill, the duo sent a letter to the cops asking for $10 million to end the ongoing terror. The case was finally solved when Malvo left his fingerprint on a document that was found at the scene of murder. The two were arrested on October 24, 2002, when the cops surrounded the vehicle where the duo was sleeping. Few reports suggested that only Malvo's fingerprints were found on the weapons. But Malvo confessed that Mohammed was the triggerman on first six shootings. Lee Boyd Malvo was first arrested under federal charges, but they were dropped. Later, he was transferred to Virginia custody and sent to jail in Fairfax County. There he was charged for two capital crimes, murder of FBI analyst Linda Franklin and murder of one more person. He was also charged with unlawful use of firearm. Many attorneys were appointed to represent him, but later the job went to Craig Cooley. The trail was moved to Chesapeake, Virginia, where Malvo pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. He stated that he was under complete control of Muhammad while carrying the crimes. One of Malvo's psychiatric witnesses testified that Muhammad had tricked Malvo into believing that the extortion money would be used to create a new nation for pure black young people in a Canadian society. On December 18, 2003, Malvo was convicted of all the charges by a jury. A few days later, the jury made a recommendation of giving him a lifetime sentence in prison without any possibility of parole. Finally on March 10, 2004, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. On October 26, 2004, he pleaded guilty to two firearms charges as well as murdering Kenneth Bridges and attempting to murder Caroline Sewell to avoid a possible death penalty. He was sentenced to life in prison and eight years imprisonment for weapon charges. When Malvo committed the crimes he was a juvenile and it was highly debatable if he would be getting death penalty or not. Since the crime was committed in two different states and both the states, Maryland and Virginia, had different rules when it came to death penalty. Maryland allowed death penalty but only if the person was an adult at the time of the crime. But Virginia allowed death penalty even to juveniles. In May 2005, he was extradited to Montgomery County, Maryland under heavy security. In 2006, he confessed that he was guilty of four additional shootings. On October 10, 2006, he also pleaded guilty of six murders in Maryland. In addition to this, he also told the police that he along with Mohammed killed Jerry Taylor in 2002. On November 8, 2006, he was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. Lee Boyd Malvo is currently incarcerated at Red Onion State Prison as inmate 118-0834. In 2007, he called a daughter of one of the victims he had killed to apologize for his misdoings. It is also believed that he had sent a letter in 2010 to apologize to John C. Gata for shooting him. In 2011, he wished to change his name in order to be safer around other inmates. But a Virginia Circuit judge denied his request. In September 2012, Washington Post interviewed him. In the interview, Malvo stated that he had been a monster. He also revealed that Muhammad used to sexually abuse him. On May 26, 2017, a Virginia Federal District Court judge overturned his sentence of life without parole stating that it was highly unconstitutional. But, on August 16, 2017, Maryland Circuit Judge Robert Greenberg decided that the rules for Virginia and Maryland differed and the judge who imposed the sentence must have considered all factors before doing so. As we conclude our exploration of these horrifying tales, let us remember the victims and their families, whose lives were forever shattered by the actions of these serial killers. May these stories serve as a stark reminder of the evil that lurks among us and the importance of striving for a safer and more compassionate world. Thank you for joining us on this disturbing but crucial journey.